filmed in front of a live studio audience, it's the Dice Breaker Podcast featuring your host, newly promoted Alex Mian! What? <laughs> <laughs> Oh my goodness, thank you, disembodied voice. Um, yeah, I'm your host. Uh, for anyone who is coming here from a certain previous stream, thank you so much for hanging on. Uh, hopefully the technical difficulties have been sorted out. If yes. you do hear anything weird, then please let us know in the chat and we'll do our best to fix it. But otherwise, thank you again for staying with us. If you're joining us for the first time, hello to you. Uh, as disembodied voice said, I'm Alex Meehan, a Ooh. newly crowned senior staff writer. My <laughs> crown. Uh, not an April Fool's. <laughs> it just happened to fall on this day. It was, uh, mm -hmm. It's just, you know, luck, fate, whatever you call it. I'm joined yeah. by two wonderful members of the team. Wow. We have with us today Maddie Cullen, hey. video producer. <laughs> How are you today? I'm doing good. Technology is not on my side today. I think I am the April Fool um, oh, of the world. It is me. I have been chosen. It's been bamboozled <laughs> by technology. It's fine. But we're here. What's happen. happening? Uh, and uh, contributor, Texan, Texan boy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Those are all true. Writer, uh, Chase Carter. Hi, howdy. Uh, I am a full 364 days of the year, so this one is no different. <laughs> How are you today? Yeah, I'm doing good. Uh, I, As people can see, if you're watching this on YouTube, I'm no longer being basked in uh, Alex's godhood. It's been stolen yep. away, so I'm safe from that. Fine. I had to siphon. I had to, like, change my power, like, take it from doing <laughs> that. And put Clean it elsewhere that. because you know, I I might be a god, but I can't do everything everywhere at once. So, um, yeah, you've got to be only one god, you know. There's a, yeah, yeah, I'm just a single god. You just goodness, one for goodness sake. <laughs> um, but if you are joining us from the live audience, hello, thank you very much. Please put your comments, questions, etc., in the chat. We'll keep an eye out for them. Uh, mm -hmm. If you would like to send us a question at any point, you can do that. Contact at dicebreaker.com. Um, I believe that's correct. If it's not, Matt Jarvis is going to tell me off. <laughs> Sounds um, right. Yeah. Uh, and for anyone listening to this as a podcast, hello to you. You can join us for the live podcast, uh, 2 p.m. BST every Friday afternoon. Uh, and as you could see, uh, it is episode number 99. Yeah, major. Means that next week is going to be a very exciting episode. Uh, so we're just gearing up. But <laughs> you should join us for episode 100 next week. Yeah. Because uh, we'll probably do something fun. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll see. Something. Um, yeah, wow, way but... to tease the audience. <laughs> no, just a little apple teaser. Just an apple teaser. Um, but for now, we're here to talk about the latest tabletop gaming news. Yeah. What we've been playing. We've got a fun little feature coming up to do with Dead by yeah. Daylight. Uh, it's all popping off here. So oh. we're going to start with what we've been playing. And I'm going to be with you. Mr. Chase Carter, tell us the goss. Uh, yeah, so um, as, as sometimes happens whenever you're a news writer, you don't play a whole lot of games. You just read about a lot of games. And mm. that's very much true for me this week. I did last weekend manage to go down and play some board games with some friends. Uh, they had um, some folks over who were new to board games. And uh, my partner and I are sort of like the like, hey, y'all have board games. Can you come and play and teach us some rules and stuff like that? So we brought some, like, beginner games down. Uh, we were tasked with, like, trying to 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 hit, like, both, like, beginner-friendly games that were, like, fun and not too crunchy, but also big enough for six players, which is an interesting little, like, cross-section. Mm -hmm. um, we brought a, a few down, and we ended up playing two 
that uh, I think were big hits. The first was like Sushi Go Party. Mm, um, classic. Mm. Yeah, a real classic one. I will say for myself, playing Sushi Go again, like it was one of the first board games I kind of picked up. And it is a very basic game. It is very <laughs> nice for, for yeah. I will say this, it is really good for beginners. It is fairly shallow as far as like what you can get out of it. And I yeah. don't want to say that's a uh -huh. knock against it, but I don't know that I'm ever going to pick it up for myself. I think it's always going to be like a game that I hand to someone who's never played a board game or has played very few and be like, here, mm. try this little game. It's fun and cute. I'm going to go play something else. Yeah. <laughs> when you just like, when you go back to like, yeah, when you go back to games that you were like, oh, I remember this is what kind of got me into the hobby. Mm -hmm. And then you play them now. That's kind of like the experience I had with Catan. I didn't love it to start with. But then going back to it after like playing a lot of games since, and mm. you're like, "Well, this is basic." <laughs> yeah. Uh, the most the most fun part of it was like one uh, one player just kept trying to make the miso soup happen. Which like, mm. if you haven't played like the miso soup is a card like you play it, and if no one else has chosen a miso soup for that round, you get it. Mm. And so just every time she would play it and then glare at everyone at the table as she tried to see if anyone else had played miso soup and then just got like sort of incredibly frustrated when anyone else did it was oh, intimidating it was miso soup uh yeah yeah it was so i think like the the group aspect was a lot more fun than the yeah than the game itself which was nice um yeah. we also played mangaka have either of you played mangaka before I've no. never even heard of this game. Tell me uh, more. Yeah, so it's it's a bit like mm, Telestrations meets uh, Japanese uh, art aesthetic. Um, okay, I love this. Ooh. Yeah, so in Mangaka, you are a mangaka. You are an artist, and you have to, like, you're drawing panels of a comic, and you get points based on, like, elements uh, based like that are based on cards that you draw that you have to work into the comic itself. Uh, and there are four rounds, and each round there are successively more panels that you have to to create. You start with two, and then you do four, and then six, and then eight. But it's all within like a time limit. We did six minutes, which was not enough. <laughs> not no, enough that doesn't all. sound yeah. like enough time. No. Yeah, you you could do eight, but eight seemed like a lot, and we we're like, no, let's give ourselves a challenge. And it was honestly very funny to see like how when you have two panels, people like were drawing all these very detailed things, and then by the time we got to eight, <laughs> people slap dashing as much yeah. as possible. Yeah, something down. Like, there's like a there's like a circle for a person, mm -hmm. and then like uh like a dog is drawn like a squiggle or something. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, um, it's very fun because like, so everyone has like their own sort of like what the game calls obsessions, like three things that like you really want to put into your art. And then after the first round, trends start appearing that you have to, that everyone has to work yeah. in. It's like, oh, this is what the market wants. Like you yeah. have to write these Check sort out. of manga. Um, and every round of more of those trends will pop up and some of them will introduce time limits. Some of them will be like, hey, use somebody else's trends like you're just a copycat like use somebody else's like uh, obsessions in your art because like mm. this is just the real popular thing everybody wants this uh and so like very quickly it becomes like trying to make the best comic into trying to fit as many of the 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 sort of prompts into your comic in whatever way possible uh all sort of mm. common sense and like narrative through line falls right apart and it gets very chaotic and it's a lot of fun uh you don't even have to be that good at art to to no. to, to play and to enjoy like it no. yeah so which is why it's a lot like you know telestrations or fake artists in that way like art ability is second to like just trying to play with the rules and seeing who can get close enough and at the end like you have to show off your comic and you have to like sort of state your case as to why uh, this 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 counts like in one of mine. I drew a basketball with sunglasses and a and a necklace and a gold necklace because we needed to put both basketball and bling in there. Ah. It did not fit in my comic at all. It was literally just like this little storyline, and then the last panel was a basketball with sunglasses and a gold chain. Look, and you I, could. I, I reckon you could just put that in the background of any like manga or anime. Yeah, like some yeah. people wouldn't question it. Right. Sure. Yeah. That's just oh, yeah. uh, that's just a sign for things to come. Um, so I, that that was a lot of fun. Uh, it's it's good chaotic humor. Like it really like if you know that you have a group that plays well together, I think Mangaka is going to be 
uh, sounds a great. Yeah, the sounds really fun. Mm. Yeah, um, are you good at drawing? Where where do you lie on that kind of? Mm, no, yeah, no, <laughs> I'm not very good. Uh, I can I can make sense. I am not quite so bad that it's all stick figures and as Alex was saying, like a doodle, like a squiggle, and trying to mm. pretend it's a dog. I can I can get my ideas across. It's not gonna. There's no finesse there. There's no skill. Um, no, no, I uh, my strength lies with words. Yeah, same to these, same to these over here. Yeah. I'm not very good at drawing. I used to have aspirations to be an illustrator way back oh. when. Uh, back when I was doing art at GCSC level. Uh, oh. But yeah, no, um, it didn't come to fruition. You know, just because you've done a picture of two red onions, uh, you know, still life doesn't necessarily mean you're going to go and become the next Carl Ferrin. So yeah. who'd have bought it? Who'd yeah. have funk? Who knew? But, what about you, know. you Maddie? Are you an artisto? No, I'm very, very bad at drawing. So every time we do drawing <laughs> games, I'm like, I just got to really lean on the comedy because otherwise people will be like, why? What is this? So I'm like, just gonna, I'll just go for that and hope for the best. No, it's I'm, funny. Whenever, yeah. whenever my family... Tennis is one of those games that my family will play with me. Mm. Uh, and my dad gets really annoyed when we play Tennis because he is a, a genuinely good artist who was like going to go to art college oh. before he was drafted into the Navy. Yeah. Um, but he, he, all he wants to do is just do nice pictures. <laughs> Like he just wants to accurately like represent exactly what yeah. is being asked of him, uh, and of course because it's time, he's I like, say, mm -hmm. "How am I supposed to do this in this amount of time?" And I'm D like, "Dad, you're not." Kind of the point of the game, <laughs> That's what like makes it a game, not just like a hobby. Yeah. So do you just continuously get half of a very detailed draw yeah, of whatever yeah. it's supposed to be, and then it's just off? Yeah. Yeah. Like. um that, that that one part of the drawing will be really good. Uh -huh. And then you've just got to try and figure out what it is from that one bit. <laughs> uh, and then, but his guessing is terrible. Like, oh. you'll be like, how is this anything like what you've guessed here? And you'll be like, oh, this this looks like that. And we'll be like, no. no. Like, so it's something that everyone could fairly like, you know, collectively agree that looks like a tomato, and then yeah. be like, it's a peach or something, and then be uh -oh. like, okay. Um, I love my dad, he's great. <laughs> <laughs> um, anything else, Chase, that you've been playing? Yeah, so I played a wee bit of uh, Tales of Zadia in a demo. I've got an article up on the site explain, kind of about it. Explain what this is, Chase. What is yeah. this? So Tales of Zadia is the officially licensed RPG for uh, the Dragon Prince. It's mm. made by the, the people who do the Cortex Prime handbook. It uses the Cortex rules. Uh, I did a, I, I, I attended like a demo with a few other journalists um, that Cortex is putting on with fandom. And we sort of went through character creation and also did just like a very short little scenario where we basically got to use some of the mechanics. So when I say I play, I like, you know, it was yeah. a very much like guided on rails sort of thing, mm -hmm. but uh, you get you get to see how it how it does. Mm. Um, yeah, so Cortex, if you're not familiar, it's a really modular tool set. It still has like six stats. You have a stat array, but more importantly to the characters, you have like these distinctions and values. Distinctions are something like this is where like race and class and like job would fall. But those aren't so much like tied to character creation as they are like sort of like narrative tools that you can rely upon whenever you're in a role play or combat situation. It's the sort of game where like everything has a dice value attached to it that ranges from a D4 to a D12. And the higher the die, the more sort of like powerful and important it is to your character. Okay. So like in a situation, if you are, say, like a member of the Knights Guard or something like that for a human kingdom, you can use that stat to sort of like influence the situation. Whether you're trying to, like, say, strong arm a bandit to get out of the way, or you are in combat, or you are trying to work with, like, another knight. And so you're kind of relying on your training as this, like, professional soldier to relate mm. to them. It's got that sort of, like, feasibility for both role play and combat situations. Mm. Um, the values are also really cool because there's, like, six defined sort of, like, principles. There's stuff like freedom, truth, 
justice, like uh, 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 these sort of like, you know, principles that make up the core of a character's beliefs. And those are also weighted with like uh, with dice as well. And so all of these can be tools that you use and like you choose which ones apply to a situation and you build a dice pool. Uh, and then you'll roll with all those dice to uh, try to get the result that you want. Um, you can, a really interesting wrinkle on that is you can take like a lower die and get a plot point, which is close to inspiration in D&D. &D. It is like a, it's like a second resource that you can use during pivotal moments to sort of like get a higher result or a better result. Do, to do cool right. stuff later on by like taking a hit now. Um, it's, so what Tales of Zadie is trying to do with this sort of stuff is one, be closer to the show, which is all about, you know, like teenagers in a fantasy, high fantasy realm where like combat is not always going to be the answer. Like the thing you're trying to do is not kill whatever is in front of you. Right. Oftentimes, like the thing you want to do is run away because you're just trying to get safely where you're going to go, or you're trying to work out what's going on. You know, it wants to tell a lot more stories than just like a bunch of adventurers armed to the teeth with metal, just sort of like kill everything in their path mm. till they get to the end of the dungeon. But also it's trying to like, pick up on what's been popular in RPGs for the last, I'd argue, like 10 years, mm. which is like a more fiction forward sort of uh, uh, setup where the tools that you have for your character are more about telling a story than it is about like completing an objective, like, mm. you know, finishing a dungeon or like looting a chest, something like that. Mm. Uh, and it's nice. I think it's really cool. It's interesting that it is, I think maybe a, 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 a three or four years too late to sort of okay. like be the thing that it is. I think a lot of other RPGs have already done this, have already done it with a little bit more finesse and a little bit more thought. Yeah. Uh, I don't think it's bad. I think it is just a little behind what's already like sort of like pushing forward. It is not on the sort of like the bleeding edge of RPG design. But that said, I still think it's like a really neat system and really fits with the world that they're playing in. Mm. It might be the case that they're leaning on the light end rather than providing a revolutionary gaming experience. Yeah. And like, you know, I don't think it's, I don't think they set out to make a revolutionary game experience. They really wanted mm -hmm. to just like as faithfully as possible. Yeah. Put this world onto the table while also making it fun. It's yeah. just, I think it's just an interesting part of this that like, while trying to be fiction forward, it does sort of like, retread old ground that we've seen in other games yeah yeah well it's just refreshing that they're not using D &D 5e <laughs> <laughs> these days uh, totally, totally. like that's it. as soon as you see it's not using D &D 5e you're like oh this is different at least yeah, yeah. you're trying something else yeah you, you really thought about what is the best system for this rather than just being like what what can yeah. we just put it in yeah, yeah. Let's put it on D&D 5e because that's what everyone plays and no one plays yeah. anything else. Um, but uh, yeah, no, I mean, I've not watched the show, so I can't really comment on that. But yeah. I've seen it on the Netflix. I've seen the trailer on the uh, Netflix because Netflix is like, oh, you watch Avatar and Korra. You want to watch The Dragon Prince, right? And I'm like, oh, I don't know. The art style is a bit... Mm. That, art, oh, that always gets me. The art is a bit uh, what, as the British would say, naff, I believe. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you um, would be correct, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, in that first season, it does get a lot better, but okay. that can be kind of a visual hurdle early like, on. Yeah, for sure. When I saw the trailer for it, I was like, that gives me Ruby vibes, if that makes sense. Uh, yep. like, I know what I you're talking about. really mm -hmm. don't like the way that Ruby, even like the late like footage I've seen from the later seasons. Yeah. I'm still not a huge fan of that 3D like uh I don't know what to call it, like anime style, but 3D. Mm -hmm. I just don't really Yeah like I... that. I would rather they do they would just stick to like a 2D or just do 3D without those kind of anime stylings. Yeah, like one or the other. Yeah, yeah. Um like Arcane, for example, I think is a perfect example of like that kind of done right, where it's like mm -hmm. 3D really trying to be, I don't know if realistic is the right term because there's loads of characters in that show that are very stylized, but yeah, yeah, yeah Nathaniel Levin's saying like CGI style, exactly. Like yeah. I and I think Arcane, that. 
Arcane like took advantage of a lot of like 2D anime like hand drawn yeah. backgrounds to yeah. sort of like really draw a nice sort of comparison where you didn't have to rely on 3D to do nice. everything and give you yeah. that weird uncanny valley kind of look. The uncanny mm. valley is the thing that really that and like the polygon style is like where mm. where there's not really much detail <laughs> yeah. to, to a person where like some of the people look quite the same apart from like this person's got this hairstyle and this person's yeah. wearing yeah. this thing it's like yeah. but the, you kind of look very similar <laughs> a bit of a paper doll situation it's like we just sort of switched out clothing mm. or hairstyles on this <laughs> yeah and this i know basic that's, model. sometimes that's because of a lower budget but then i sure. would argue maybe don't do the CGI style if you have a low budget. Yeah. I think it can come out as like particularly bad. Realistically, we all are kind of shallow. We want stuff to look nice. Like, especially well... if, you know, it's animated. Like, art is quite a bit of a thing. Like, I, I always think this of like, I open up a comic or a show and I'm like, if you're like not pretty enough, like, you're I'm already just not. It's interested. not even just pretty. It's just like, yeah. like um that new Studio Ghibli film that came out last year that. Did not get good reviews. Poor old Goro. Oh, uh... Um, yeah. Is it? it... Oh my god, I can't. It's like it's weevil now. or something like that. Yeah, he's, he's it, got like it, the name it... of a bug. Yeah, it's like earwig. Earwig. And the uh... witch is something. Yes. Yeah. yeah but yeah. like, um, just... yeah. Usually, one. I'm an absolute sucker for editing Ghibli, and like Goro. Mm. Miyazaki has made good films in the past. Like he, I, you know, Earthsea, Tales from Earthsea is, you know, a choice. But then from Up on Poppy yeah. Hill, I really like, and I really yeah, like when Marnie was there. And I'm pretty sure Goro did that as well. Uh, and then, like, you know, he slowly, Earwig and the Witch, that was it. Thank you, Phil. He's slowly been pulling himself out of what we call the Earthsea hole. <laughs> yeah <laughs> and he's like he's it feels like he's finally sort of gained a bit more recognition and then he makes a film like earwig and the witch was which has not been received very well and like a big criticism of it it just looks awful like yeah, it just I, looks so bad like, i never thought i like would not watch a ghibli film but i was like yeah i just don't think i just don't like the way this looks i'm not no it's not like it. they've gone for a cgi style but the problem is they don't have very much experience with it at all because obviously they've always done a lot of hand-drawn with cgi like in that sometimes where it's needed yeah. but they've not completely relied on it and like you can oh just the way that film looks is just awful like i, I think i blocked that from my memory because i forgot that until you mentioned it and that was all just like come flooding back yeah it's it's gross oh. and like people are, were not very complimentary about the plot either but oh. um, maybe fantasy weird... just isn't his thing doesn't have a weird musical number in the middle Does probably <laughs> i mean like nothing will ever top all dogs go to heaven with giant crocodile sorry alligator oh, no. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Uh, this is America yeah. where alligators. Yeah, sorry. Pay respects to giant alligator who lives in the sewer. Um, <laughs> but I, it wouldn't surprise me just from like what I saw of the trailer and then what I've heard of people's opinions who I respect. Uh, no, poor old Goro. You, you know, you've got to. Yeah. Keep going, mate. <laughs> Do you Try think it's again. a case? Do you think it's a case of him trying to find an identity out from underneath the yeah. shadow of his dad? Probably. Mm -hmm. For sure. And, he, and he's just taking some weird swings that don't work out because, like, everyone's expecting him just to be Miyazaki, like, be the second coming in Miyazaki. And he's like, please, I'm my own person. I want to have my own style and legacy. Yeah, no. Knowing what the kind of reputation that Miyazaki has is, like, perfection, perfection, perfection. Yeah. I imagine that that is a very difficult... Yeah. shadow to live under but anyway this is not a ghibli <laughs> no, but... not yet <laughs> not yet <laughs> uh no it's a tabletop gaming podcast uh so if there's not anything else chase we're gonna move on to maddie maddie yeah. what i have done a lot of like reading and making characters and stuff but not quite playing like a couple of things so that's mm -hmm. what i'm at i my kids on bikes book arrived which i'm very excited about nice. yeah, you're excited about that um, last week yes i've been waiting 
been waiting excitedly but it finally arrived so over the weekend I had a little sit on the beach had a little read through um yeah and I really like what I see I I haven't ever played um like an RPG where it's like very player led and that like sometimes the players are coming up with what happens next mm. and I'm not sure mm. like how I feel about it especially because I wanted to do like a kind of Scooby-Doo style mystery and I was like you can't really do a mystery if like they're not picking up clues and I'm laying something out for them if they're just like making up what happens next I'm not sure how it would work so I think I'm gonna try and like strike a bit of balance and maybe well ease in you could always look at um we've talked about Brindlewood Bay in the past and Brindlewood Bay does something very interesting where there is no set like solution to any of the mysteries um the players just find clues that then the the GM is like, oh, this is what you found. And then they deduce who the who the culprit is. And if they mm, roll well fun. enough, then that is who the culprit is. Like, oh, yeah. okay. Yeah. So they are just like making the mystery yeah. happen. Yeah. I love yeah. That. that is fun. And then if the roll isn't good enough, they're like, you got almost there, but there's like a weird complication. Yeah. Like if there's like an apparent thing, but it's like you take the mask off and there's just another mask that you didn't take off. <laughs> um, I will say. On top of that, Brindlewood Bay is a great choice, but there's another game that uses the Brindlewood Bay rules called Paranormal Inc. by Alicia Furness. Mm. Uh, that is specifically like the framing devices. There is a bunch of like paranormal investigators that are starting like a really scrappy, uh, uh, like, like their outfit. They are like the Scooby Doo gang where they're going into haunted places to try to solve it. Uh, and so it's all that's a GM list game though. So like if you're not into GM list games, that could be a weird hurdle, but like. It is very much like the players are leading the mystery and it uses the Brindlewood Bay rules to like to do that. Yeah, that's cool. I think if I was like going into it not with a GM, I think I'd find that easier because we're all in the same boat. But I was like, mm-hmm. I think because I'm going to be the GM for kids on bikes and I had all these like story ideas. And I was like, oh, so well, they could just be like, not this. And I was well, like, it, mm. it's still the case when whenever you're whenever you're GMing anything. Yeah. Like you don't want to railroad your your players too much oh, yeah, regardless. Of and like this is something I sometimes struggle with where I'm like, this is exactly how I want it to go. It's never gonna go like that. You know, it's not yeah. so it might be the case of maybe you have a very overarching general story that hopefully they can touch on all of the bases that you want them to. But this then I was thinking. don't mm. maybe have one exact outcome or one exact like mm. villain or whoever you want to call it like behind it. Um, yeah, around your horse says your your friends are here to play. I'm sure they'll pick up on what you're putting down, especially if you lean hard into the Scooby Doo vibes. Oh yeah, like I'm I'm, I'm doing it because these friends love Scooby Doo, and it's like I haven't seen them for two years, so it's like we're reuniting. Can we always watch Scooby Doo? So I was like, what if uh-huh. we lived Scooby Doo? Maddie, don't That's you very mean, cute. Don't you mean Scobby Wobby Woo? Scobby Wobby Woo, as he's <laughs> more commonly known. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Chase is looking so confused. <laughs> this is, this is just one of those regional things, huh? N- no. Four hour let's play of us doing Call of the Nether Deep. You need to watch. I have not. Yeah. I think Chase That's needs that. to watch our four hour let's play of Call I of the Nether Deep. Let's just get it on now. Let's just get it on and we'll just hit. Where could I find this if I wanted to watch this four hour let's play of Call of the Nether Deep? Well, well you just pop over to the youtube channel where you are right now yeah just <laughs> after this after this yeah go over to <laughs> do not click away youtube.com slash dicebreaker to is. watch our excellent playthrough of call of the neville deep never right. deep uh yeah, dm'd by the lovely liv kennedy so um you should do that to find out more about scobby wobby woo uh but no <laughs> i think you'll fun. do a great job maddie um thank you I've heard good things about kids on bikes, and mm. Uh, mm. it sounds like it could be a good fit for your plans. Yeah, I, I reckon so. I think it'll be good. But yes, yeah, so I haven't actually played yet, so we'll we'll mm. we'll see. I will feed back in a couple of weeks' time how it went. Yeah, we want to hear the update. We want to hear the kids on bike update. <laughs> um, <laughs> anything else, Maddie? Yeah, again, I on the other side of things, I've made two characters. Um, I've been like gradually developing for mutants and masterminds, like the superhero um, role playing game. There are several superhero mm. role playing games, and this is one I've not yeah. heard of. Ah, yeah, we looked at a couple of them because 
obviously it's quite hard trying to do a superhero role playing game because realistically like as a player this is what I wanted I wanted to make whatever I wanted I was like yeah. I want to make specifically so I have a intergalactic roller derby like champion and then nice. I have like kind of suicide squad person who's called Dolly Mixture um and she's like an evil evil kind of like anti-hero type uh person that everything's based around like sweets and sugar and she owns the sweet so Holly Quinn yeah yeah basically yeah, yeah. if she opened a bakery yeah yeah but yeah, if Harley Quinn opened a bakery, <laughs> I would watch stuff. that. After Birds of Prey, I would I would yeah. quite happily watch that. Oh, I would. It would be everything I wanted, which is why mm. I'm just living it in my role play dreams. Mm. Um, but yeah, we went. The system is pretty good, and the it's quite easy to make like whatever kind of character you want without like because some of that we look. I think we looked at champions, which is like just very like there's it's a lot to take in it's like very mm. crunchy it's very like okay there's a lot of things happening um, yeah so yeah I think it was what we, we've settled on in the end um but yeah I've just started making my characters and just like getting into it but I'm excited to be a superhero like yeah um, all I want <laughs> obviously there's the official Marvel role-playing game coming out next year yeah um which is like the first Marvel official RPG in quite a while yeah, um, the other one was, yeah, a lot older. Old, old. Uh, like, beloved, but <laughs> Yeah, old. beloved, but old now. And obviously, with Marvel being as hot as it is, mm. like, it's understandable that they're making a new one. Uh, there's also City of Mist. Yeah, that's like the more, uh, yeah, I think that's the first one we looked at, which is when we were like, oh, yeah, we could be superheroes. Like, why have we not yeah. done that yet? We could be heroes. Could, Just for one be. day. Could, could happen yeah make it happen <laughs> um well i mean i'd be excited to hear about how that goes your your roller derby character and your sweets based anti-hero yes <laughs> two sides of my the two wolves that are inside me for those two characters <laughs> roller so derby do, and sweets yes. so you're doing the thing where like your role play characters are very much just who you would want to be. It's not like an extant character. It's just like this is me, but in like a certain fantasy. Yes. Do have I did I, did I used to do roller derby for recently? Yes. And do I want more of that? Yes. Do I love sweets? Yes. <laughs> I'm so a simple you, woman. <laughs> you can use parts of yourself to create a character. That's perfectly exactly. fine. I'm just yeah. I'm not great at roller derby, so now I can be. I can protect. <laughs> That's the fantasy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You can do sick flips and parkour. Yes, exactly. Rather yeah. than just like practice falling and then try and get back up really badly. Yeah. And as an intergalactic roller derby. Derbyer? Mm. Yes. <laughs> uh, you can just do like sick tricks all over the entire planet. Like yeah. across planet. Roller skate up the wall. On an asteroid. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Exactly. Oh, I can envision that now. That sounds great. Yeah. Uh, anything yeah. else, Maddie? Um, I think stuff that I've played with you, but I saw that we you were going to talk about, about that. that. Why I was like, I'll. We can I'll talk about that. that together. Yeah, let's do it now. <laughs> Chase can sit on his little stool and be a good boy. <laughs> Listen, go. Please tell <laughs> me about all these board games I've been playing. We'll give you some apple Uh, we'll give you some apple slices if you're very good. Thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah, we played together some games because we had our little game day this week, which allows us to just play some damn board games together, which is yeah, something we often struggle really to do. Really nice. Yeah, it was very nice. Uh, we played Quacks of Quedlinburg. Yeah, which is a classic. Mm -hmm. And we actually have the Quack Queen on the podcast today. <laughs> I am Queen of Quacks. It's true. Yeah. Queen of all Quacks. In Ducks or otherwise. Yeah. Um, Every time. Yeah, I won. We've met Jarvis. We were, a team. We were definitely in a team <laughs> yeah. together. It yeah. definitely wasn't the case that Matt was working while I was making all the decisions. And then yeah. occasionally he would be like, oh, that looks great. Well done, Alex. <laughs> <laughs> well, he I was present. Approval. He was present. Ish. Yeah. Um, Physically, he was present. Yes. Um, uh, mentally speaking, he was working. Yes. <laughs> um, but uh yeah, I want that. Uh I love Quacks of Quedlinburg. It's actually now I think up there with one of my favorite games just ever. I just nice. love Quacks so much. Like yeah. 
is just, really fun. It's a banger. <laughs> it is because I think like it's just pretty simple. Like like once you get into it, you know what you're doing, and you can just like go through it. Risk reward. Just, yeah, it's yeah. just so exhilarating. <laughs> yeah, it's like gambling, but not. <laughs> yeah, but fantasy because it's poker. yeah, it's like, won't lose any money. <laughs> no. Although I still stand by the fact that it, it needs a new release, it needs new artwork. I just yeah, just can't. That's fair. yeah. I was complaining about the front cover actually. Like, oh, uh, yeah. you've officially complained about this on the website. I have uh-huh. officially complained about this on the website. You can go read that on dicebreak.com. Thank you, Chase. Um, I and love that we... our op-ed section is just of- uh, us officially professionally complaining. Yeah, officially complaining. That's yeah. what I get paid for. Uh-huh. Yeah, like absolutely. you don't realize that the the term senior staff writer is actually just official complainer. Yeah, well, queen, queen of quacks, but also queen of complaints. Queen of queen of quacks and complaints. Yeah. Um, and we also played together a little game called Pax Premier Second Edition. <laughs> Woo! Very fun. Which you also played yesterday for the stream, which you can go yes. watch now. Still didn't win. Spoilers! <laughs> oh, unless? Unless. <laughs> unless. Mm. <laughs> hey, I mean, falls. I did, I did well, I'll falls. say, you know. I did okay. um, yeah, no, we play Pact to Me at Second Edition, which is a board game created by Cole Worley, who is the designer of Root, amongst other games. And this is one of his historical board games, where he gets to be an absolute nerd about history and also make a really... <laughs> Well designed game. Yeah. The band loves history. <laughs> yeah. Uh he really does. And this particular board game is about Afghanistan during the 19th century, uh, where essentially Russia and Britain doing their classic thing of being the worst, mm-hmm. uh, trying to be the colonizers that they often are. Um and Afghanistan kind of like dealing with the, those power plays. So you play as Afghani kind of politicians who are, are choosing to gain favor with the different kind of powers operating in Afghanistan at the time, which yeah. were the British, Russian, and the actual Afghanistans who lived there. Um, and so the game, you know, tells this narrative of power plays through the cards that have interesting information on them uh, about these different people and the different aspect of you know the historical period and also through the actual like gameplay because in the game you're trying to essentially muscle in on different areas mm. there are error control aspects of it there's a little bit there's a tiny bit of fighting uh, but a lot of it is just being clever about spending your rupees, acquiring cards, and choosing, you know, which of these different sides you want to ally with, because yeah. you can change that at any time. Um, which is, I think, a, a big thing is where I go wrong, because I just stick to loyalty, and it doesn't get me anywhere. <laughs> but, like, Wheels was constantly changing, and he was like, that was really, really paying off, and I was like, oh. Yeah, Wheels is a turncoat, yeah. he really Absolutely. is. Absolutely. Absolute no loyalty. <laughs> As soon as you can stab in the back yeah <laughs> um but yeah i find that element very interesting because there are consequences to changing your allegiances mm. because any kind of cards or you know things that you've kind of set up in play before you have to discard whenever you play a card that is directly tied to one of the other sides um but obviously sometimes it's better to step away from maybe what everyone else is trying to do in the hopes that you can get more, you know, you can achieve more by siding with a different kind of allegiance because yeah. we found like when everyone was fighting over one, trying to gain, you know, influence over one particular side, then it was kind of a struggle because, you know, you're all, you're all trying to grab the same thing. Uh, but then sometimes changing allegiances doesn't always work, as I found out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that it, it's a very, very interesting game. Mm. I feel like it's one, again, with a lot of cold early games you have to play multiple times to really get your head around. Yeah. Uh, we did make some mistakes. 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> in the first in the game that I played, um, where some rules were forgotten or or misunderstood or whatever. So it didn't exactly play out how it could have gone. We accidentally um, ended up with like four rupees in the economy. And yeah, it was like a bad time. between us and we were like, what do we do to the economy? And we're like, what do we do? How do we afford um, anything? Like, I we just buy anything. <laughs> <laughs> and it turned out one of the rules had been forgotten to do with that but um yeah. it's fine i don't think i would have really achieved much either like <laughs> no. even if that happened because <laughs> i i made the bad decision of going with the british like partly way through uh, always yeah. a bad decision uh and i'll say you figured you would know better yeah i'd know better um <laughs> and alas it didn't quite work out um because those the uh, the people who sided with uh, the Afghans were just killing it. They were just killing yeah. it. There were three oh of them God. versus I, I was Britain and then uh, Maddie was with Russia forever, yeah. lo loyalist forever. But um, that didn't work that. out either because we were no. like fighting. It was like we were fighting a two wave. But although Maddie and I weren't really fighting one another, we were just too we were trying to work together with, to bring them back. Yeah, down. we but were trying to work together we with were that. Too small. But, yeah, and also. You know, there's certain aspects like you, your how many cards you can play is determined mm. on certain cards turning up, and mm -hmm. you know, certain things just don't go your way, which that happens in history sometimes. So it's yeah. kind of a nice representation of that. But I wasn't blown away by it. I have to say, I love the concept of it, and I imagine mm. it wasn't helped by some of us, you know, getting getting some of the rules wrong. Yeah. Um, yeah. But it wasn't. It didn't really feel like root. <laughs> Where it's not fair, just yeah. like it's obviously a different game from Root. That was the point. It's more like as soon as I the first time I played Root, I was like, oh my god, I want to do this again. Yeah, I straight away like, okay, I want to do it again. I'm gonna do this, this, and this, and like yeah. yeah. Whereas with Pax Mir, it's much more like I'm not quite sure what went wrong or like mm. what I didn't do right mm. or whether I could have done something differently or whether it was yeah. just things didn't go my way. And yeah. I think there are elements of that game where like if certain cards aren't aren't drawn into the market you're just kind of a bit screwed like particularly if certain mm. cards related to your the, the the thing you want to gain influence with yeah or like cards allow your court which is how many cards you can play from your hand there are you've got to get certain cards to increase your court like and if you can't get those like i did at one point i couldn't get them you're just stuck with yeah. you can swap out cards but you've got to discard the ones that you don't you 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 don't want in your court and sometimes you're like i don't want to mm. do that i just want to yeah. add more cards to this so um yeah it's definitely an interesting game Liv was really into it which mm. yeah like kudos to her i think she really gets it um, yeah she's good she like i i could tell because on her turns she would take a lot more time than on mine like she'd have a lot more to do because she'd set yeah. up and like and you're like, and get to hey. mine i was like there's one thing I can do because I haven't prepared well. Uh oh. <laughs> um, yeah, and she yeah did very well in the live stream. She did. Very mm. well. uh, you can go and watch that now on yeah. YouTube slash Uh But uh, I also played some other games as well, including the latest edition of Betrayal at House on the Hill. <laughs> Do you get more stuff. games in? Because I know you've played like one before your impressions piece on the site. Yeah, I've only played it once. Um, so take everything I say with a pinch of salt. Mm. Because it's the kind of game where one game... Betrayal is just the kind of game where one game might be amazing and another game might just be like garbage just because yeah. of That's the bad. horn or because certain things just don't turn out right or maybe mm. someone forgets a rule or whatever. But um this is betrayal at the house let's start again this is betrayal at house on the hill third edition which uh came out today wow in the uk Fresh um, you. sorry yeah. americans you've got sorry, a few more americans. months to wait sorry you have to wait until august which is quite a way away but hopefully it'll be worth it um but i managed to get my hands on it a bit early just through circumstance um so some of the retail copies were releasing before the actual release date but um, such a weird, such yeah a weird industry yeah we're my friend just got a copy like a week early it's just oh. bizarre but um perfectly timed uh and yeah 
Uh, essentially, from what I can see, it's just better in every single way so far. Uh... So I'm a big fan of the second edition. I love Betrayal at Alpha Hill. Uh, it's got problems. <laughs> uh, some of the haunts are bad. Some of them are poorly balanced. It's relying on a lot of luck. And so mm. the rule book is written very confusingly. Uh, and the components are kind of a bit gammy. But in the new third edition, number one, it looks amazing. Like the art style is really nice. It's been all, all of it's been redone. The box actually gives you an idea of what the hell the game is about. That's fun. Which is a nice change. Oh, there's a cat. Um, yeah, he's right by the mic. Sorry, everyone. <laughs> I have a little room. No, no. Um, yeah, uh, Xavier's very happy about it as well. Um, the components are all really nice. Like the miniatures don't look like they're melting. Um, <laughs> they were quite funny. <laughs> they are. They are classically wonderful. But. Um, the, the the components are now specifically labeled, which is such a lovely little thing. The tokens, Ooh. so it doesn't just say monster or dog. It says like Stevens monster or like, duh, 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 and they just look a lot better as well. Um, nice. The characters have all been redone, and there's more diversity in the uh, characters as well. More representation. Um, what else is really good about the game? The rule book is a lot clearer. Um, it's it states up front some of the changes that have been made to the rules, which um, include um, things like the haunt rules are now different and more based around how Betrayal at Baldur's Gate did it, which is uh, you roll a you roll a dice for each number of omens you found, um, uh, okay. and if you roll five or over, uh, the haunt starts, and mm -hmm. it's as simple as that. And, what that means is that the haunt can't physically start until like the third omen you find at the earliest, at the earliest possible oh. moment. So that means it gives you a bit more time to potentially set things up before haunt suddenly happens and you're like, That's oh no, good. this is terribly <laughs> balanced. <laughs> that, that was one of the big problems was the balance is having a haunt happen five minutes into the first phase yeah. and you're like, we're all dead. Yeah, not yeah. Work. Uh, it's either terrible for the survivors or terrible for the traitor. Yeah. Um, the, uh, another thing is how turns work um, they no longer end when you have to draw a card they end if you discover a room or you choose to stop uh, which again um, helps spread out those omens a bit more which will hopefully improve the pacing of the game although I will say our mm. haunt happened still quite early on <laughs> but it didn't break the game which was really good oh, to see good. yeah so i'm hoping yeah. that things have been designed specifically to improve some of the balance because betrayal has always been one of those games that you just accept is a bit broken and that's fine that's part yeah. of its charm <laughs> yeah um you don't go into this game from a strategic perspective like if you did that you're going to get <laughs> seriously disappointed <laughs> good luck uh, yeah, this is a game about atmosphere, and I will say third edition does a really good job of pushing that atmosphere mm. because um, it's got a new set of cards that you randomly draw from, which tell you the overarching story as to why your oh. investigators are going into the mansion to start off with. And that, what I'm really this, interested in that. Yeah, what this does is it doesn't just provide you with a starting narrative to kind of set things off and yeah, set like a tone and give you like a lot a nice little story snippet to to begin mm. with it also will determine will, which haunts you'll be able to trigger because the mm. haunts are um are connected to each of the different cards so each of the the cards will only have a certain amount of haunts that you can actually trigger on it like mm. and that this means not only are they more connected to the starting narrative? You can also avoid, you more easily avoid some of the haunt that maybe you've done before uh, by just picking nice. a different starting card. Just nice. Yeah. Um, cool. So the one that we started with, uh, what actually came up in the haunt that we triggered as mm -hmm. like a narrative element of it. So it's like, oh, you came in here for this. This is actually what's happened because of that. And immediately it just cool. felt more, more. It, makes sense. Like it, it just felt yeah. more betrayal. It just felt more yeah. like, 
this is the story aspects of the game are just being pushed more and more into like in into the the limelight which is really the big appeal of playing betrayal so i thought the aspect was really good um the haunt was fun uh i think one rule was was misread or forgotten but it was quickly rectified and it was pretty damn well balanced like nice. the 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 winning side just about won like it could have gone either way and to be honest again a lot of the roles just determined like how things played out mm. and there were moments of like where we, we were all just like oh <laughs> like, <laughs> <laughs> we didn't expect this to happen and um, oh that's so cool that's like just was, what you want it was it was really good <laughs> like, yeah. i had such a good time and um it just feels like i know we were having a discussion a few weeks ago where we were talking about what we want from the new betrayal i'm not sure if you joined yet Nate, but um no. We we were like, what's our dream? What would be our dream improvements? And it just feels mm. like they've done, they've just done <laughs> they everything that I wanted for them to. <laughs> what I wanted them to improve. It looks better. It feels uh -huh. better. Like they they all the haunts are new. The one I I played, I've never experienced before. Uh, and I love this new starting narrative thing. I think it's just such a good idea, and it's. It, yeah, it's just really good. they they just know what people it's like they know what people enjoy about betrayal mm. and they're like we're really gonna lean into that so uh, i've only played it once you can read my thoughts on dicebreaker.com there's a yeah. preview piece there and we will hopefully be getting a, a copy soon in the office yeah. so we can play it uh a lot more later and hopefully do a full proper review once uh we get better idea of because obviously all these factors particularly some of the new rules and obviously with the new haunts we don't know if this might not work in other scenarios mm. or some of the haunts might be just outright rubbish right so one of the big complaints was like consistency between the haunts like some of them really were yeah. some of them were just yeah. tossing in the trash yeah some of them are really great like um the one where you become really small and you're like running around the house trying to find like all the different like things you need to to go back to the right size and other times they're really rubbish like it's a giant spider you fight the giant spider yeah that's, that's boring <laughs> um yeah the combat was always the worst part of betrayal and here it, it there was com there wasn't a heck of a lot of combat in in the haunt that we were playing um it happened but it wasn't mandatory if that makes sense at least not yeah. for the survivors um which was really refreshing to see because the the quack space the quacks <laughs> i'm going mad the uh the horns based around <laughs> see this is what happens when you become queen of quacks you just <laughs> it invades your, your you. entire being um <laughs> like the haunts that were revolved around almost entirely just you fight this thing were always the most boring ones mm. um so i'm hoping that the majority of these haunts aren't like that and that they play around a bit more with you know the formula and some of the the ideas and mechanics yeah. and things so yeah betrayal is good so far big thumbs up <laughs> after one game <laughs> We're, we're like whenever a piece of uh whenever a, like a package comes into the office now we're all like yeah Could is it, it true <laughs> is it, <laughs> is it? <laughs> and then we open it and it's not and we're like oh <laughs> <laughs> um let's move on to news everyone news news i'm in the chopper thanks uh, oh, chopper's good. been Less. upgraded Ooh. senior staff writer oh yeah you, do you have a new seat has it got your crown in there so you can just sort of lounge in your chopper as it flies by the news it's got a cup holder oh that's nice, nice. <laughs> that's why our budget's broke we got that copper yeah we the got the cup we, holder we got the chopper cup holder yeah for my cup of morning joe um <laughs> yeah uh we're going to sort of graze over these briefly because one we started late and two mm. You can read more about all of this on the website. 
dicebreaker.com. You've heard it before. Mm -hmm. You'll hear it in the future. Um, let's get going. So our first bit of news is um, GameFound, which is like a rival to Kickstarter as a crowdfunding platform has announced that it is opening a beta for all tabletop creators. Meaning that whereas previously it was set up by Awakened Realms, which is in itself a, mm. a, a tabletop publisher, and then it was making some deals or at least some sort of like connection with other publishers. Um, now it's basically opening up a beta to say, hey, if you want to crowd some crowdfund something, you can Come do on, on this platform now. And it's quite a tantalizing prospect to a lot of people mm. because Kickstarter has been making a lot of um a lot of mistakes it recently, is, yeah. a lot of bad decisions. Yes. Um such as uh, well, primarily to do with introducing blockchain garbage to uh, mm -hmm. that people just don't want anything to do with because that sucks. Uh, <laughs> and so they're looking at game founders like this is an alternative that doesn't involve that stuff. Uh, you can read more about it on the website, uh, and we will be covering game found in the future. You can guarantee that. But game founders already had quite a few uh, big ish campaigns on it, including the mm. Skyrim uh, adventure game 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 i can't remember the name of that title it's just incredibly <laughs> long unnecessarily but uh and it's had some announcements that some new games are going to be launched on it such as the new game from cyanide and happiness which people really like that stuff i'm not that fast <laughs> but um yeah it's getting some big releases coming on it yeah. and now it's opening up the gates the fud gates for like everyone else so it's going to be interesting how this progresses. Yeah, I'll be interested to see how like RPGs take the space because, mm. like you said, it's mm. more been for board games. Yeah, like especially like larger board games that are more in that Kickstarter format, like that has tons of plastic pieces and miniatures and stuff like that. Mm. Uh, the only few RPGs that have really done so are like I think like Tony Vicinda's Down We Go and uh, uh, Cyber Metal Twenty Twelve uh, did a campaign a few months ago on there. Uh, so. I really interested because like as popular as GameFound is, it really hasn't had that many like breakout RPG successes. Yeah. So. Yeah. It's been much more of a board game platform so far, yeah. but mm -hmm. we will have to see because obviously there are a lot of people migrating away from Kickstarter. And I think a lot of tabletop RPG people are going to itch, which is understandable because yeah. kind of you know it, already. Itch is kind of that place that a lot of people go to for rpgs anyway yeah but um it would be interesting to see if they go to game found now that it's opened up a bit more so we'll have to see yep. where that goes mm -hmm. um other news the chopper is swerving Ooh. um a cough a bit of coffee's been spilled we didn't factor <laughs> this into <laughs> oh no the design bad couple to design Mm. I think you should get one of those like helmets with your coffee cup and like a straw, and then it can't spill. Oh, that yeah. so good. Definitely yeah. Drinking hot coffee out. through a straw is a definitely yeah, a good idea. That's right? definitely a good mm -hmm. idea. It will never go wrong. Nothing <laughs> wrong with that. Um, in more serious note, <clears throat> uh, Scott Benny, who has previously worked on uh, all sorts of things like Dungeons and Dragons, the World of Warcraft RPG, Lord of the Rings RPG. You also wrote uh, on the original Fallout video game. Wow. Um, has unfortunately passed away at the age of 61. Um, I am a, a middling fan of Fallout. Um, I have a great respect for the original and its mm. sequel. And obviously Dungeons and Dragons, like it's lots of love for the World of Warcraft RPG and the Lord of the Rings original role-playing game as well. So... Um, you can read more about his life and his work on dicebreaker.com. There's news pieces there, as well as uh, various posts by people, various posts made by people who knew him. Uh, and it's just a, a real damn shame mm -hmm. um, to have passed away at that age. And um, um, yeah, uh, love and legacy. respect and care to his family. Mm -hmm. um, 
the last, well, not the last bit of news, but another little bit of news we got here that you can briefly read is there is a new skirmish war game set in the D and D universe called mm. Onslaught. That was just found at Gamma. <laughs> this is I love what when happens. this happens. Yeah. This is this is the reality of the tabletop gaming industry. Like yeah. it, you will just find that stuff exists because you go to a convention and they just have it there. <laughs> like huh. uh, it's classic, but it's being made by WizKids, who have previously cool. done several Dungeons and Dragons board games that people seem to like, which are like the adventure style games. So like mm. they also do like all the miniature lines as well, which yeah makes sense. Lots of yeah. miniatures. Ooh, boy. Oh boy. Yeah. <laughs> um. And so it seems like they're combining those two things into a new skirmish war game. Uh, mm -hmm. You can find out more details on the website, guysbreaker.com. Uh, but it looks like it's coming in September. Ooh, so, soon. Yeah, so Maddie, as a, a, a lover of small miniatures games and Dungeons yeah. Dragons, this could be the one for you. I'm excited to try that out. Yeah, I love yeah. I yeah, I definitely have a bunch of with kids minis, so I'm ready. I'm prepared. Yeah. You're you're ready, you're prepared, you're pumped. I hope that they take a more sort of like miniature agnostic approach that you can use a lot of those old whiz kids miniatures or like any of your mm. other stuff. Like it's it would be the very sort of Wizards of the Coast approach that they're like there's gonna be an official line of miniatures that are specifically made for this game, but I kinda hope they do the more sort of like open route where you can use sort of whatever oh, you have yeah. on hand. Yeah, I mean that's there the is... thing that turns most people off from the hobby, like trying to get all of the things. They're like, yeah. Yeah. Easy for us. I mean, yep. there is going to be obviously a core set mm. that will include various units you can use for either side of of the battle, let's call mm -hmm. it. Uh, and apparently there's going to be tournament and in-store support as well for kind of, yeah, like official play. Uh, mm -hmm. But um, all of these details were discovered by looking at the back of the box. <laughs> oh, <laughs> wow. Once okay. again, who needs to oh. remind anything? <laughs> no. uh, the final oh. bit of news uh, is uh, Magic the Gathering related. We're going to pull Chase into the chopper. Yep. Chase. I'm crawling up the ladder, Bat or, uh, yeah. Yeah, Batman style. <laughs> yeah, we're Adam still West flying. Batman. You're you're climbing up the ladder. Uh -huh. um, tell us about Pro Tour. Right, yeah, I'll make this very brief because otherwise this is a deep rabbit hole that you can fall into. <laughs> uh, I try to do my best to like cover it uh, from a sort of like, I don't know anything about it perspective on the mm. piece that I put on the website. So the Magic Pro Tour is back, which is its old competitive mode, like competitive path to like world championship. It started in 96 and ran until 2018, was just a staple of competitive magic until Wizards just unceremoniously axed it. Um, there are a classic lot of- Classic Wizards, by the a way. Lot of, That's a, really classic Wizards to just ax something out of nowhere, because why not? To, yeah, to be fair, the support for that on Wizard side had sort of been waning. There was a lot of, uh, mm. a lot of, a lot of pro players had some complaints about how they were sort of being treated and like the sort of like support they were getting. And then, well, in 2018, Magic Arena came out. Wizards put a lot of money and sort of investment in Magic Arena being like its new home for everything. And so they got rid of the Pro Tour to introduce like the Magic Pro League as well as Rivals League and all these like weird, complicated routes to like become a pro player and to play in competitive tournaments that nobody really liked at all. And then the pandemic happened. <laughs> uh -huh. And so like the last three or four years have been really complicated for Pro Magic. But with the return of the Pro Tour, we're seeing a very condensed, simplified version by going back to this thing everyone already knew mm. uh, with a little bit more simplification and a little bit more rules uh, as far as like how they're going to work in Magic Online as well as Magic Arena. The details on that are still a little unclear. We're there, but they said by the end of the month, they're gonna outline that. But the new one is gonna be very much focused on go to your local game store, play in some like leagues there, you do well enough, you go to regional qualifiers. You do well at the regional comp uh, competitions, you get to uh, go to one of three Pro Tour events that they're going to host each year. And you do well enough at those Pro Tours, you get to go to the World Championship. It is, they are advertising as this very straight, sort of like very distinct path that everyone should be able to understand. Um, the wrinkle here that I outlined in the piece and I, I still don't know about is how COVID's going to affect this. Mm. Like anytime COVID comes, 
yeah, anytime they talk about like, you know, oh, we're doing in-person events again. And they're like, well, if like dates and stuff are going to kind of depend on how COVID's going and mm -hmm. do we have yeah. mask mandates? Do we have vaccination mandates? Do we do not? We will decide that and talk more about it later. So that's kind of, for me, like the safety issue, especially in local game stores, because they're yeah. relying a lot on local game stores to host this right. sort of stuff. I haven't said yeah. a whole lot. It's so. not like an official tournament where they can enforce those kind of measures. Yep. Like if you don't do these, you just don't play. Yeah. You know, you're relying on local stores who maybe don't have that kind of authority to, yep. you know, like, or might not even want to, like personally, you know, then that calls into all sorts of issues and problems. And it's a classic thing of just not acknowledging COVID apparently means that it doesn't exist anymore. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I can state for a fact that it definitely does exist. Mm, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's par for the course that like, you know, I, for both of us as both Americans and British people, like both of our governments are sort of just a, trying to say that COVID is a solved problem. Yeah. It it doesn't, just, it's not an issue anymore. It just, no, yeah, Go ahead, do whatever you're going to do, which Wizards is take kind of taking as like, well, whenever we can rely on local organizations or regional governments to sort of mm -hmm. like handle it, we'll just be hands off and say like, well, you know, talk to them first. We don't have to make any decisions, which is mm -hmm. disappointing, but expected. Mm, that is disappointing. Yeah. Um, you could read more about that news piece and others on dicebreak.com. Uh, nice. Along with all these other fantastic articles I'm going to go through quickly, there is that betrayal preview I mentioned. Uh, mm -hmm. We, meaning me, did an interview with Mike Ponsmith, the creator of Cyberpunk, mm -hmm. uh, about the RPG and why it keeps going and why it's important and Cyberpunk 2077 and all that goodness. Uh, mm -hmm. We have a new two-player board games list up on the site. Ooh, fresh out of the oven, hot and fresh, spicy pizza. Uh, you can read right now. Uh, so if you're struggling for ideas for you and uh, your friend, significant other, family member, whatever games to play, there are some great ideas there. We also have a list of the best traditional games. Uh, Nice. That you shouldn't ignore just because they're old. Um, and uh, Chase spoke about the Dragon Prince earlier, wrote some lovely news on that RPG and your experiences nice. with it. So you can read all of that on ricebreaker.com. We've got news every day, we've got lists, we've got features. Love it. Come back. So good. <laughs> um, we're going to have a very quick segment. I think we're not going to have. Uh, questions today because we started so late but yeah. we're gonna have a fun little thing we're gonna do uh yeah. just to round things off on a friday um yeah. so you may or may not know there is a board game based on dead by daylight <sighs> the video game popular relatively Exciting. popular horror video game who who's played it here i haven't i've Great. watched Great. I'm Watched the only one. Played. This is some I'm fantastic stuff. Actually played. <laughs> um, we're gonna we know this... the concept, though, right? Yeah, yeah we're going to call this segment familiar. "Dead by Dicebreaker." Yeah, I mean, it's a good name. It's, it's a, a very great good name. name. I wanted to use the name. Um, the Kickstarter campaign for the "Dead by Daylight" board game launched this week, and it's doing pretty well. We have a lovely little interview on the site that you can read by Matt Jarvis uh, with nice. the, the creators. If you want to learn more about this upcoming board game, but I thought it would be fun for us to uh, chat about what we think our perks would be if we were in Dead by Daylight. So to explain that to those who may or may not know, Dead by Daylight is a, a video game, now a board game, uh, where you play as either a group of survivors or a killer. As a survivor, you have to work together to run across the map and find these different generators that you need to fix in order to escape this terrible nightmare that you found yourself in. As the killer, you have to find them and stop them and kill them. So, You're talking um, about like meat hooks and stuff, right? Yeah, yeah. meat hooks. And the oh, new board right. game has like actual little hooks. Oh, it's so oh good. no way. That you hang the, that you can hang the survivors on oh. too. So. That's, That's so really cool. cool. Um, but 
uh, perks are essentially these little little benefits that you can get um, as a survivor and a killer, but we're going to stick with survival. Um, and they're things like, oh, if you get someone of a hook, you can like run faster afterwards. Oh, you can you can heal yourself even if you don't have a medikit, stuff like that. Mm-hmm. So uh, if you were a survivor in the Dead by Daylight board game, what kind of perks do you think you would have? You can think of any. You don't obviously you won't know funny. any specifically from the game, but um Yeah. I think one of mine would be um because this is just a perk that my friends get for hanging out with me. It's just like having a little snack to pep your energy. I have one friend who she gets very hangry. So every time we meet up, if it's like between meals I will always bring her a snack because I know she won't have had breakfast yet and she'll be hangry when we hang out so I was like I'll just like here's a little a little thing so are you the best uh, friend ever (laughs) yeah that's good (laughs) so I'm like I just bring a little snack for people boost your energy up are they like the little naked bars oh yeah like a little cereal bar a little 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 something I can carry around in my bag little apple box of ratings yeah yeah (laughs) yeah um Delicious. So you think your character would carry on a little snack bag? Yeah, a and little lunch bag. You could give one of your fellow survivors a delicious little snack, maybe Hello, to heal them a bit. Hello Kitty bus stop <laughs> lunch. Uh, yes! Oh my god, the Hello Kitty bus stop lunch box. Yeah. The first time I saw that, I was like, what is that? What's in it? it? Tell me more about this lunch box. <laughs> Yeah. And, you, and then you opened up but my mind was blown even more. Got my little grapes in there. Got my adult Lunchables that I make with my little crackers and my cheese. <laughs> adult Lunchables is just wonderful. <laughs> Did you That's have it. Lunchables, Chase? Oh, yeah. Are you kidding me? Absolutely. Oh. Yeah, I wasn't sure if they were a US thing as well. Like the I, th- I thought they were only a US thing. I thought they were yeah. a US thing, just no. generally. And we also had them a little bit. Yeah, we had the Dairy Lee Lunchables, right? Yeah, yeah. That uh, you, that you you get a little piece of cheese. Yeah, yeah. A little piece of ham, a little, little, little cracker. Yeah, little, like little, little wedge. pieces. So much plastic. <laughs> a lot of packaging for that little bit of food stuff. A little bit of food stuff, yeah. and then of course you had the Dairyly Dunkers, which other cheese products are available. <laughs> um, yeah, that sounds great. What about you, Chase? Mm-hmm. Do you think you would have what kind of perk do you think you'd have? Uh, I think I'd be able to, so I think I'd be able to like waylay the killer to allow mm-hmm. my 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 uh, comrades to get away yeah. by launching into just an overwrought, unimportant anecdote. <laughs> uh, just start a story and just meander, just go off on an on an audible tangent uh-huh. and uh, just hold them up for a while while everyone else sort of like gets away. I'm Maybe imagining... it means I. Sorry, I'm just imagining the killer like like the guy who has like the big chainsaw or something, just like standing there, uh-huh, like, like chainsaw very politely, like, like mm-hmm. listening to you and you. So you weave uh, a yarn. Yeah. yeah, they just over there kicking rocks, holding their machete in one hand, and just sort of like being like, uh, oh, uh-huh. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> it would either be that, or I'd be able to deploy my cats as a distraction. Oh, oh, I love that. That would get me too. if I was a killer. Yeah. Like yeah. you can you can deploy uh, if they're coming towards like a generator work on, you can deploy it and the cat just like Yeah. See Xavier, the tuxedo that was just up here, he'd be like a sentry cat and he would yell really loudly if anyone mm. got close. While Leroy's more of like an attack thing. He goes straight for the face, disappears, but they're love uh that. they're uh disoriented for a bit. Mm. That's like an excellent perk, yeah. Yeah. Um, by the way, uh, listeners, viewers in the chat, tell us what perks you think you'd have. Yeah, let us uh, know. We want to know. Um, Nathaniel Levy says, just thinking of all the license needs for all the killers. Are they going to ignore them? Uh, yes, the board game will not be including the killer's license from other like oh, series okay. and things. So there's not going to be any Pyramid Head. There's not going to be any Freddy. Freddy's not going to be there. R.I.P. Freddy. <laughs> yeah. Um, Pyramid Head is like my biggest fear thing, so I'm kind of I'd rather really. Not. <laughs> yeah, I had su- I have such a horrible distinctive memory of playing Silent Hill two, and it scarred me for life. Well, but he, he 
his original model in the game had a big old butt. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then they yeah. reduced it, cowards. I can't believe that. Give the people what they want. <laughs> yeah, give the people what they want. <sighs> yeah, let be double cheeked up. Yeah, come on. Uh, at least give us something good to look at when we're being killed. Mm -hmm. Like thrown over your shoulder and you're just looking down at his yeah. powerful butt. His powerful behind. It's like, if this is the way I have to go out, well. Yeah, at least worst. I'm lo looking into the face uh, of God while I'm dying. Uh, um, I, I will say they not all their dlc killers are like are licensed there are others mm. that are unlicensed such as um the one of the ones that we quite like playing with or against is the trickster i believe he's called which is like a like a k-pop star i've seen that yeah my friends who like this game really like Love the trickster yeah. they think it's Ooh. like an incredible concept and like executed really well yeah and he looks well you know yeah <laughs> well that's part of it right it's more of like a psychological killer where he like works his way in and then like oh it's an he seems like a superstar like you want to get to know him but then he turns out to be an absolute nightmare yeah yeah we we always say whenever we're running away from him we're like that um little vid you know the video of the guy who's running on, on the beach and he keeps falling over and be like oh oh no i fell over you know that one. <laughs> it's like it's like we're like him we're like oh no i'm being chased it's like i hope you don't catch me Ooh. yeah i'll go oh, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> um my perk would probably be um i don't know I, i'm quite a loud person so maybe i could i like that like attract the attention of the killer so that my like fellow survivors can can escape or something like would mm -hmm. anything be pigeon based that's also an excellent idea yeah i oh, could a pigeons. have a flock of pigeons yeah <laughs> like just land maybe a flock of pigeons just land somewhere and like it sounds like like one of the sounds that sometimes the survivors make and the killer's like oh survivors over there and they actually get over there and it turns out it's just, it's just a bunch a of pigeons fly up bunch in their of face. pigeons yeah i'm just imagining you just disappearing into a flock of pigeons oh all, like, wow come, that's okay flock of pigeons, <laughs> and then they just disappear and you're gone that's yeah, yeah. Right. <laughs> it's like batman but instead of yeah that, it's just a load of pigeons and they just also happened to just poo everywhere at the same time <laughs> and the killer's like oh oh god oh it's in my eyes like it's everywhere like pigeon we're just um, creating brightons for a superhero i guess <laughs> pigeon, <laughs> pigeon girl yeah. yeah i mean uh like the there are crows in the video game I'm, oh. i can't remember if they're they're included in the board game or if they're just like aesthetic thing but sometimes if you run past the crow like it will make a noise and run oh, fly. like fly away and then that will give away people's position oh no see the pigeons you're like the opposite of that pigeons wouldn't do that the pigeons, pigeons don't homies. care the, <laughs> they really do not the, the pigeons will just squat like on the walls and then if you just walk past them they'll just be like Ooh. Um, yeah that'd be good yeah or I like or that. i would turn it into a to an unassuming slug <laughs> <laughs> just become slug become slug would nice. be the perk just be called become slug Perfect. and then at any moment if i think a killer's coming my way i could just become slug i love that and then there's just a little slug on the ground just a slug <laughs> just no, a nothing slug. to nothing to be concerned about just slug i'm just a widow slug but it's a timed me. thing so if the killer like uh... sticks around long enough then i pop out of the slug if he's like oh this is a cool slug i'm gonna see what where this thing goes <laughs> <laughs> I want to see what this I want to see this slug story play out <laughs> yeah. yeah I'm invested now and then I'm like damn I made this uh, I made the slug too intriguing <laughs> <sighs> um Batty wrong leg says make fellow survivors momentarily invisible to the killer that would be pretty strong your pigeons can do that yeah the pigeons <laughs> but only if you like bribe them with some chips first right yeah, yeah. yeah I mean, and you gotta... empty it on your head, like <laughs> oh god, or something, and then they just flop. <laughs> I mean, people would won't be surprised to know that oh, he's been he's been exiled. Oh. 
he's, he's being such deployed. a rowdy boy. Yeah, <laughs> I'm deploying the cat. Yeah, I need my sentry cat. Deploy the cat. Yeah, there's a cat coming. Uh, <laughs> people won't be surprised to know that I do feed the pigeons in my local area. No, and they are the funniest little things because you'll put the tray of food out and then they'll come and like gobble it up because they're greedy uh and then they'll they always knock the tray over onto the damn floor and then they'll fly off me like oh no and then they'll come back a bit later in the hopes that i picked it up and refilled it do you believe that the pigeons in your immediate area have like a bot like a, a body weight index that's just like three times as high as pigeons in any other area <laughs> they're just look it's not just me feeding them clearly because like it just they're just round they're just round pigeons they can just find food anywhere like that's yeah. trash all around i mean in, yeah including me just, <laughs> that is, big old bit of trash um yeah. arandra for says my perk would be board game boon where i set up a board game in the middle of the map and the killer avoids the area because he doesn't want me to ask him to play another game safe zone <laughs> Nice. That's very good. <laughs> no, I don't want to play another game of Battleship. You beat me last time. <laughs> it's Game's really silly. Of, of Pax Pamir and it's not moving anywhere. <laughs> uh, Steven says my perk would be likely be tripping and avoiding attacks from the killer due to my own clumsiness. <laughs> I do like that. Yeah, can relate. Yeah. I can relate. Yeah, I'm. I'm like I'm a protagonist for a young adult novel. Just my only fault is clumsiness. <laughs> Shy and clumsy. Shy and clumsy, definitely. Um, wow. Well, Which is just the two things that get you two very hot men attracted to you, and like oh, you're just yeah. gonna trip right into a love triangle. Oh, oh my look, god. I'm, look, I'm not even that pretty. Okay, I'm just yeah. I'm just vaguely naturally pretty. And uh, just like night, it's just like I'm not like any of the other girls, and it's really hard being. So yeah, not like any of all. the other girls. It's, okay. Yeah. Like... All right. Anyway, that's the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Buddy and I are slipping into our dating sim discussion that we were having yesterday. Yes. <laughs> we're gonna oh, turn this into on. a we're I'm gonna back. turn we're gonna turn this into a visual novel <laughs> podcast. Yes. Matt can't stop us. Oh my god, yes. <laughs> he, he's not here, he can't stop. Here's where uh, the train goes off the tracks, yeah. Yeah, maybe next week for the hundred episode yeah. we'll just completely just let things rip. Um anyway. Uh yeah, let's let's close things out, everyone. Yeah. Um thank you so much for watching. Um you can join us, like I said, here every week, Friday, 2 p.m. It's BST now, because that's yeah. a thing. Ignore and it's very when I good. Tweet GM2. Yep, ignore, ignore that. that. <laughs> it's 2 p.m. BST. Um yeah, like I said. You can go to dicebreaker.com to read all the latest articles from mm -hmm. myself, from Chase, from Matt, and various other people. Maddie. Yes. You tell can... us about the Dicebreaker yeah. <laughs> YouTube channel on Dicebreaker Plus. Where you're here right now, you should stick around because there is always great, great content coming out. Saturday and Sunday, you're going to see some wonderful videos, some very mm. exciting things. Tell us about the videos. What can people expect? What can people expect? We had a great chat with Chase about the new Jurassic yeah. World Legacy game, <gasps> which I am sounds amazing. Um, we got some lovely B-roll of it, and it's just like a great little introduction. Um, so yeah, definitely check that out coming at the weekend. So yeah, subscribe, hit the notification bell, and then you won't miss it. You'll know when it's happening, which is mm. perfect. And you can also join Dice Baker Plus for even extra special fun membership stuff. Liv has got a very, very fun video coming yeah. out there, so you don't want to miss it. I watched a couple yeah. of clips and incredible. So yeah, we were getting pumped up for it. And then we <laughs> yeah. had a very, very deep discussion about <laughs> yes. various things related to that. It was wonderful. It yeah, was wonderful. So... so yeah, you should join Dicebreaker Plus. You that also you get should. access to all our emojis, our lovely emojis that you can use yeah. in the chat. Uh, oh, no. But until next week, uh, Maddie, Colin, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Sounds so aggressive. 
<laughs> Thank you for joining us. Thank you for loving me. <laughs> and Chase Carter. Yep, always glad to be here. Yeah, always glad to have you here. And to you, our lovely viewers and listeners, thank you so much for joining us. Come back next week for the hundredth episode. But what? until then, I've been your host, Alex Meehan. And most importantly, have a lovely day. Bye.